you, and good morning. So I'd like to start with an apology for arriving late at this school. Uh, I've spent the last three days interviewing prospective undergraduates in Oxford. That was something that was impossible to move. The only advantage I can see of having arrived late was that I had a somewhat easier journey here than some of you did. <coughs> So Henrik asked me to talk about the physics of magnetoreception, in particular the radical pair mechanism. So he will cover the biology in the next lecture. I'm going to talk about the physics. Um, I'm not a biologist, and so it's probably just as well that I'm not telling you anything about the biology. <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to talk about is a chemical compass in night migratory songbirds. So the basic idea is this, that there is a chemical reaction somewhere in the bird's body that is sensitive to magnetic fields as weak as that of the Earth. So schematically, we have a reaction here, an array of reactant molecules in blue which can be converted into short-lived reaction intermediates known as radical pairs. And we'll come on to what they are in a minute. And the radical pairs, which may last for only a microsecond or so, can do two things. Either they can come back where they started, revert to the reactant molecules, or they can go on to form products in red. So there's a branching ratio, the blue and the red arrows. Some fraction go forward, some fraction go back. So the basic idea is that this happens inside the bird's body, that it's sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field, and in particular the direction of the field, so that it is a compass and not necessarily an intensity sensor. And also, that it is light dependent. So the radical pairs are formed after excitation of the reactant molecules by light from the sun or maybe the moon or stars. So this idea goes back to 1978 uh, and is due to Klaus Schulten. And since his original proposal, it's been shown that the compass really is light dependent in birds supporting the idea that it might need the energy of blue and green <coughs> photons to produce the radical pairs, which are the magnetically sensitive species in this mechanism. So all you need, really, for a compass is that when the bird changes the direction of its body in the Earth's magnetic field, then the branching ratio, blue to red, changes. So we can see here, the way I've drawn it, there are more of the red product molecules here when the bird is oriented like this than there were here when it was oriented like that. And so all the bird needs to do to register the direction of the Earth's magnetic field is to detect the difference in the yields of these red product molecules. Yes. Uh, shouldn't the transfer from the product molecule to the radical pairs also be light dependent? Uh, sorry, which step? From the, the, the uh, from the product molecules, you also have to go back to the radical pairs at some point. No, you don't. Oh, oh well, yeah, eventually, um, in the dark and much more slowly, probably the red will revert to blue. But that needn't involve light. And that need not be magnetically sensitive. OK, now, um, at first sight, this idea seems pretty improbable. If you think about the energetics of a chemical reaction responding to the Earth's magnetic field, then very quickly you can convince yourself that it's total rubbish. And the argument goes something like this, and the argument is wrong. And I'm going to try to explain why. So when we assess whether a particular interaction might or might not be important in chemistry, for example, we need to know 
whether it is bigger or smaller than the thermal energy, which is Boltzmann's constant multiplied by the temperature. So that's the energy that all molecules have by virtue of their thermal motion. So they're moving around, they're vibrating, they're rotating, and the amount of energy they have depends on temperature, and per molecule, it's given by this product, KBT. So if an interaction is comparable to or bigger than KT, then it's likely to be significant. So for example, chemical bonds often are 10 or 100 times stronger than KT, the energy required to break a bond. And that's why molecules on the whole don't shake themselves to bits. The energy of the bond is larger than this thermal energy of the random motions of the molecules. But if you have an interaction that is much smaller than KT, then it'll be totally swamped by these random motions, and for the most part, you can forget about it. So KT, if you express it as a molar quantity, is not very big. It's two and a half kilojoules per mole, and typical chemical bonds might be around 100 kilojoules per mole. So if you ask yourself, what is the energy of the interaction of a molecule with the Earth's magnetic field, then it's about 10 million times smaller than KT. So you would say thermodynamically, that interaction is negligible. There's no way that the Earth's magnetic field could change the course of a chemical reaction. And up to a point, you would be right. But I want to explain why that's not the whole story. So if you think of an imperfect analogy for a chemical reaction, imagine it's like taking a heavy stone block and tipping it over, and that would convert products into reactants. And of course, that requires quite a lot of energy. You have to raise the center of gravity of the block uh, to get it to convert into these so-called products. And then imagining that a magnetic field could affect the rate at which that happens is like imagining that a fly bumping into the side of the block is going to have a significant effect on the rate at which it tips over. So that's the thermodynamic argument I've just been through. And of course, it's perfectly correct, but it's not the whole story. If instead you imagine that you've already put in the energy to get the stone block into this state, Clearly, this is not a stable state. It's highly non-equilibrium. The stone is poised here. It could fall backwards. It could tip forwards. And if, while it's teetering there, poised at this non-equilibrium state, if then the fly lands on it, that could make a significant difference to the probability that it goes forward or back. So tiny amounts of energy applied at the right moment to a highly non-equilibrium state can have profound <coughs> effects. And this is analogous to the radical pair. So that, in a sense, is what this mechanism is. So I'm going to spend most of the rest of the lecture trying to explain what radical pairs are and why they can be sensitive to these very weak magnetic fields. So that requires me to talk a bit about electrons, about spin, radicals, and radical pairs. So first of all, electrons have a property known as spin angular momentum, or just spin for short. And that's often represented by little arrows, which may point up or down. So it's tempting to think of spin in terms of classical mechanics. So here's an electron, sort of, and you can imagine like a miniature planet, it's spinning around its axis, uh, shown here in red. Now that's a very classical picture and it's a bit misleading because spin is a fundamentally quantum mechanical property which has no exact classical analog. So it's better to think of spin as a property like mass or <coughs> charge some particles have it, some don't. But the electron does. It's a quantum mechanical property, and it's described by a quantum number s, which for the electron has a value one half. 
And we'll see in a minute the significance of that number. And associated with spin, angular momentum, is a magnetic moment. So every particle that has a spin is also magnetic. Now, again, it's tempting to think of this in terms of classical mechanics. The electron, as you know, is charged. And if you think of it as a spinning ball, it's a moving charge. And then rather like a current in a loop of wire, that will generate a magnetic field. So you could argue that a spinning charged particle would generate a magnetic field. That's quite a nice argument, but it's clearly not the whole story because the neutron also has spin and also has a magnetic moment, but it has no charge. So that argument is too classical, really. So you just need to accept that particles with spin also have magnetic moments. So electrons are magnetic. They're miniature magnets, if you like. OK, now, what about radicals? So most molecules have e an even number of electrons. And those electrons pair up in such a way that their spins are opposite, and so are their magnetic moments. So a pair of electrons with opposite spins have no net magnetism. The two magnetic moments cancel out. But a radical is a molecule that has an odd number of electrons. And so clearly, not all of them can be paired up. There is one electron left over, unpaired, and that means that radicals are magnetic because they have this unpaired electron. Radical pairs, as the name suggests, are two radicals, and they need to be created simultaneously, usually by a chemical reaction. So, for example, if we take a simple molecule, methane, CH4, a tetrahedral molecule with four covalent bonds between carbon in the centre and the hydrogen <coughs> atoms, if we just break one of the bonds, such that the two electrons in the bond end up one in each of the two fragments, then we will have made a radical pair. So there are two electrons with opposite spins in each of the four covalent bonds here. When we break one, we end up with two neutral fragments, a methyl radical and a hydrogen radical, otherwise known as a hydrogen atom, and the dots here represent the unpaired electrons. So radicals have dots in these slides. So that's a radical pair. And quantum mechanically, we can describe that in terms of its total spin angular momentum. So remember, each electron has spin one half, quantum number. And so the radical pair with the two electrons, quantum mechanically, can be either a singlet state, so-called, which has, roughly speaking, opposite spins and a total spin of zero, or it can be a triplet state in which the two spins, roughly speaking, are parallel, and then the quantum number is equal to one. So one half plus one half. So these are the two allowed quantum states of a radical pair, singlet and triplet. And one of the properties of organic radicals, and we're going to be talking exclusively about organic radicals that don't have heavy metal atoms in them, is that the reactions that involve both of the radicals conserve spin. So you're used to the idea of conservation of energy. There's also a conservation law for spin angular momentum. So for example, going back to methane, here are the two electrons in the covalent bond with opposite spins. When we break that bond to form neutral fragments, one electron ends up on each of the radicals, and they still have opposite spins when the radical pair is formed. And so we're forming the radical pair in a singlet state, not in a triplet, because the Precursor had all of its spins paired up, and so a total spin of zero, so it too was a singlet state. So chemical reactions that go from singlet to singlet 
are allowed. Anything that would go from singlet to triplet would be forbidden. Another example would be an electron transfer reaction. And most of the reactions I'm going to talk about are electron transfers. So if an electron jumps from A to B, if these are molecules that have even numbers of electrons, all of them paired up, these are both singlet states, and so the radical pair formed from them by electron transfer would be a singlet. And the reverse reaction also conserves spin. So having produced a singlet radical pair, if the electron jumps back where it came from, that so that the products are singlet, then that too will be spin allowed. Uh, hello. Right, here we are. Sorry, this thing's not very reliable. So just a moment to think about what this electron transfer reaction really is. So if we think we have a pair of molecules A and B, one of which is going to be an electron donor, the other electron acceptor, then each of them will have a, a whole stack of molecular orbitals in which the electrons sit. And what I've shown here are just the two highest energy molecular orbitals in each of these molecules. So HOMO stands for highest occupied molecular orbital. And so here we are, two paired electrons in each of the HOMOs. But let's suppose the electron acceptor also has a higher unoccupied molecular orbital, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, the LUMO. And molecules do have excited states, which normally are empty of electrons. So if we shine light on the acceptor, for example, then it can absorb light if the light is of the right frequency, and that will excite an electron from the HOMO to the LUMO. And then there is the possibility of an electron transfer from the donor to the acceptor. And that works like that. So the net effect of those two steps are to produce a radical pair. Now we have an unpaired electron here in the HOMO of the donor and one in the LUMO of the acceptor. This one is positively charged because it's lost an electron. This one's negatively charged because it's gained an electron. So this is our radical pair, formed initially in a singlet state with opposite spins for the two unpaired electrons. OK, now I need to talk about interactions within the radicals, magnetic interactions, without which there would be no sensitivity at all to the Earth's magnetic field. And the key to those interactions are the spins of the nuclei of certain atoms. So atomic nuclei, some of them, also have spin angular momentum and therefore also magnetic moments. Those magnetic moments are not as strong as those of the electron. Typically, they're about a 1,000 times weaker. But they are there. And they interact, those magnetic moments, with the magnetic moment of the electron. So highly schematically, we can think of the electron here interacting simultaneously with a number of nuclear magnetic moments. And those interactions are called hyperfine interactions. So which nuclei are we talking about? Well, not carbon or oxygen. So these are the <coughs> naturally abundant isotopes of carbon and oxygen, carbon-12, oxygen-16, and neither of them has nuclear spin. So they don't have magnetic moments, so we can forget about them. Carbon and oxygen do have magnetic isotopes. Carbon-13 and oxygen-17 do have nuclear spin, but there are not very many of those atoms around. Only 1% of carbons are carbon-13. Even less than that of oxygen is oxygen-17. Uh, so we can forget about those as well. So the important nuclei are going to be hydrogen and nitrogen, both of which 
do have spin, and both of which have essentially 100% almost natural abundance. So we've got lots of hydrogen protons and nitrogen-14, and they have significant magnetic moments. And as I said just now, without those magnetic moments interacting with the electron spins in each of the radicals, there can be no effect of the Earth's magnetic field, and so no compass. But the good news is that almost every organic radical you can think of has at least one hydrogen and or nitrogen near the unpaired electron. It's very difficult to think, actually, of biologically significant radicals that don't satisfy this condition. So let's have a look <coughs> at a specific radical, just to make this a little bit more concrete. So this is a radical I'll say more about later. So it's a compound, um, this group here of three fused six-membered rings. Uh, this is a flavin, it's a yellow compound. It absorbs light in the blue region of the visible spectrum. And we can represent the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, the one into which the electron goes when you form a radical from this flavin molecule. We can represent that molecular orbital like this. So I've still got the framework of the molecule here in gray and white. White are the hydrogen atoms, gray are the carbons. And then you can't see it very well, but there are a few blue ones here, which are the nitrogens. And what you notice is that this molecular orbital is smeared out over the whole of the ring system of the molecule. So that means the electron is not localized on one atom, but spread out, delocalized, over the whole radical. And that's fairly typical for organic radicals. And so we can anticipate that the electron spin will interact with quite a large number of the hydrogens and the nitrogens in this radical. So essentially the electron, by being delocalized, can be everywhere at once, simultaneously interacting with many magnetic nuclei. And that's borne out if you then use this molecular orbital to calculate what these hyperfine interactions would be. And so here we have a representation of the form of these hyperfine interactions for each of the nuclear spins with the unpaired electron in this radical. Okay, so the bigger these blobs, and they're all centered at the corresponding atom, the bigger the blobs, the stronger the magnetic interaction of that atom, of its nucleus, with the electron spin. So you see, for example, this nitrogen here has very little amplitude in the molecular orbital. I should say the color scheme here is, this is a representation of the wave function. And wave functions can have positive and negative amplitude. And those are the two different colors here. But there's very little amplitude of the wave function on this nitrogen. And you can see here, essentially, no hyperfine coupling. But there's plenty of amplitude of the wave function on these two central nitrogens, and they have big hyperfine interactions shown by these sort of figure of eight shapes. So the size of these blobs represents the size of the interaction, and their shape tells you about the properties of the interaction. So for example, these methyl protons here, the methyl group is attached to a carbon which has a lot of spin density in the radical, and so we have big hyperfine interactions for those three methyl protons. But the blobs are essentially spherical. So that means that that interaction is isotropic. It's the same in all directions. However, if you look at the two nitrogens, this one here with its figure of eight shape, and that one much bigger, the two nitrogens in the central ring, these are clearly not spherical. These are anisotropic. So that means that the interaction is different in different directions. If you put the electron um, here above the plane of the ring, it'll have a stronger interaction with this nitrogen than if you put it in the plane of the ring. And that's going to be important because we want a compass direction sensor here. And so we need anisotropic interactions. 
interactions that will change depending on the direction of the field relative to the radicals. And these two nitrogens, as we'll see later, if I don't run out of time, uh, are crucial for the uh, compass properties. Yes? So in, in this case, it would also vary for two opposing cardinal directions, for example? Or would oh, what, you mean if you were above or below? Yeah. No. Okay. No, so if, if you uh, exactly invert through the center of the atom, then you have exactly the same. And these interactions are typically in the range from microtesla to millitesla. Many of these hyperfine interactions are stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. So we have strong internal interactions which need to be modified by a weaker interaction with an external field, that of the Earth. Okay, just one slide giving you a few numbers just to make this slightly more concrete. For this flavin radical here, and also for a radical derived from the amino acid tryptophan, which we will return to later, I've just picked out three of the larger hyperfine interactions in each of those two radicals. So N5 and N10 are these two, and then H6 is the one on that position. And similarly for the tryptophan. And for each nucleus, we have three numbers. And these are the X, Y, and Z components of the hyperfine interaction. So for example, for N5 at this position, there is a big Z component and small and slightly negative X and Y components. So this is a highly anisotropic hyperfine interaction. That was the big figure of eight on the previous slide. And what you notice is that these are in millitesla, the Earth's magnetic field is roughly 0.05 millitesla, so quite a, a lot of these numbers are substantially bigger than the Earth's magnetic field. A few of them are smaller, that, that one component for this H1 proton, for example. All right, so where have we got to? We've got a pair of reactants, which are singlet states with all their even number of electrons paired up. We shine light on them. One of them absorbs light, and that triggers an electron transfer between them. And that forms a radical pair, initially in a singlet state, conserving spin. So here's a very crude representation of what we have. Two radicals, A dot plus, B dot minus. Here we are. The electron in the center, each electron interacting with a number of nuclear spins. Now, because we have those hyperfine interactions, shown here with the blue lines, what they can do is to flip over one of or the other of the electron spins. And that's represented by this and by that. So if you flip over one of these electron spins, you go from a singlet state in which the two spins are anti-parallel, cancelling out, to a triplet state, just flip this over, where now the spins are roughly parallel, corresponding to a total spin of one and a triplet radical pair. And that's represented here by these curly arrows. But it's much more interesting than this, and crucially so for the magnetic sensitivity. This is coherent. This is the quantum mechanics at the heart of the radical pair mechanism. It's not just that one or both of the electron spins flip over because they're interacting with all these magnetic nuclei. They don't just flip, they oscillate from singlet to triplet and back again. And so a very crude representation of that would be if my remote control were to work. Ah, right. There we are, something like that. So don't take this too literally. Once again, it's a bit too classical, but the interactions of the nuclear spins with the electron spins can cause the radical pair to cycle from singlet to triplet and back again at frequencies determined by the strengths of the hyperfine interactions. <coughs> 
And so that's shown rather more quantum mechanically here. You can do a simple calculation of a radical pair produced in a singlet state, put in a few typical hyperfine interactions, and then calculate as a function of time here up to one microsecond the probability that it's in a singlet state. So the initial probability is one, and what we see is it just oscillates, not at a single frequency, but at several frequencies. I think I put two nuclear spins into this calculation, so two different hyperfine interactions. And the frequencies of these oscillations, you can see you've got several oscillations within a microsecond, so they're, they're of the order of 10 megahertz, because those were the strengths of the hyperfine interactions. So a few millitesla. OK, so why have we got these oscillations? Well, we can start to think about that in terms of the energy levels of the spins in the radicals, the electron spin and the nuclear spin. So schematically, these spins will have a variety of energy levels shown here. So energy is on a vertical scale increasing upwards. And the more nuclear spins you have, the more of these energy levels there are. And the quantum mechanics of this tells you that if we pick out two of these energy levels, <coughs> separated by an energy delta E, then that corresponds to a frequency nu, according to this equation. H is Planck's constant. And so corresponding to every energy gap here, we have a frequency. The bigger the energy gap, the bigger the frequency. And roughly speaking, the oscillations I showed you just now in the singlet probability are these frequencies corresponding to gaps between energy levels. So the bigger the gap, the faster the singlet will convert into triplet and back to singlet and so on. And of course, there are lots of energy gaps. There's another one, and another one, and another one. So we have lots of frequencies, all of which are trying to convert singlet into triplet and back again at different frequencies. Peter? Yes? Can you explain again what's the source of this energy? Because it's not the photon anymore. The photon was the no, one. No, it's not the photon. So, so these the are just the magnetic energies. So they're the splittings of these energy levels are principally from the couplings between the electron spin and the nuclear spins. And also, if there is an external field present, that interaction with the electron spin. But that provides enough energy to jump back and forth? Because you need energy to go back to the... Uh, these, are, these are pretty small energies. All of these energies are tiny compared to KT. So, so you don't need to put in extra energy to get these oscillations. You get them naturally. So, and you can see that there are going to be a huge number, potentially, of these different frequencies. If you have n energy levels, then you have of the order of n squared over 2 pairs, and so that many frequencies. All right, so that's what's happening in the absence of an external field. We're oscillating at megahertz frequencies, typically between single and triplet. When you switch on a magnetic field, 50 microtesla, comparable to that of the Earth, then you change the time dependence a bit. And that's because you're shifting around those energy levels. The magnetic field inter interacts with the electron spin and moves some of those energy levels and therefore moves the frequencies corresponding to the gaps between them and changes the frequencies and maybe also the amplitudes of all these oscillations. And then if you rotate that magnetic field by 90 degrees, let's say, it changes yet again. And that's because the hyperfine interactions were anisotropic. So especially those nitrogens, you remember, in the central ring, highly anisotropic magnetic interactions with the electron spins, and so the direction of the magnetic field relative to the radicals matters. And you get spin dynamics which depend on the presence of the magnetic field, but also its direction. 
even though the magnetic field you apply is weaker by perhaps an order of magnitude than these internal hyperfine interactions. All you need to do is to make sure that you wait at least 0.1 of a microsecond. If you look in the first 0.1 microsecond of these three, they all look pretty much the same. But as soon as you get beyond that point, up to half a microsecond, say, then they're starting to look different. And what we're going to be interested in is the difference between the fields pointing in different directions, because we want a direction sensor. OK, now, if you then look at this one most clearly, you can see that what's happening is that we've still got the fast oscillations that came from the hyperfine interactions, but superimposed, we have a slower modulation. You can see it also here less clearly in the blue than in the red. And, whoops, sorry. The period of that oscillation is about 700 nanoseconds. And that's a frequency of 1.4 megahertz. So what's special about 1.4 megahertz? OK, so this is the only slide I've got with equations on it. Just to warn you, it's um, in advance. So energy levels in the magnetic field. So if we forget for the moment, yes? So could you please go back to the previous slide? So how do you calculate those probabilities? Right, good. You take the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, you put into a spin Hamiltonian the hyperfine interactions and the Zeeman interaction with the applied field, and then you just solve that as a function of time. Uh, are you adding a magnetic uh, potential as well? The magnetic field, yes. Yes, and uh, do you have other kind of potential there? That you Sorry, I didn't hear. Do you Is have there any, kind, any other kind of potential that you should No, have? no, it's, it's entirely a spin Hamiltonian. Okay. So we leave out all the other interactions. And you don't have here any kind of spherical symmetry at all, so no. you just No symmetry. So if we just think about energy levels again, but forget about hyperfine interactions for the moment, so just focus on the electron spin. Again, energy going vertically. So in the absence of a magnetic field, in the absence of magnetic nuclei, then the electron experiences no magnetic interaction at all, and so spin up and spin down have equal energy. If then you switch on a magnetic field, you split these two states apart in energy, you stabilize the state with the electron spin down, pointing against the field direction, and you destabilize the other spin state where the spin is pointing along the field direction. And the splitting of these energy levels is delta E. And the energy splitting that you get here, again, we can write as Planck's constant times a frequency, and that's known as the Larmor frequency. And that's equal to this product here. So again, H is Planck's constant. Mu B is the Bohr magneton, another fundamental constant. G E is the so-called electron G value, which has this value just a little bit bigger than 2. B here is the strength of the magnetic field that caused this splitting and nu L is the Larmor frequency. And if you put numbers into this equation, the numbers here, you find a Larmor frequency given by this expression. So the frequency in hertz is proportional to the strength of the field. The stronger the field, the bigger the splitting, and the bigger the frequency. And the pro constant of proportionality is 2.8 times 10 to the 10 when the field is in Tesla and the frequency is in hertz. So if you just substitute in an Earth's magnetic field, say 50 microtesla, into that equation, you end up with 1.4 megahertz. So the Larmor frequency in the Earth's magnetic field for a free electron is this 1.4 megahertz, corresponding to a period of 700 nanoseconds. And so the calculation I did to get these things was one in which I put the magnetic nuclei into both of them into one radical, and I had no hyperfine interactions in the other radical. 
So that second radical was only interacting with the Earth's magnetic field and so had exactly these energy levels, just two, split by an energy corresponding to 1.4 megahertz. That's why that modulation is so clear in the red trace on the previous slide. Okay, and then just a final equation just to complete this. While we're at it, Boltzmann's constant has this value at 300 Kelvin, then you can easily see that the energy corresponding to the interaction of the electron spin with the Earth's field is indeed this 10 to minus 7 times kT, the number I had on one of the first slides. Okay, now where have we got to? So, what we've shown, yes? Um, in this cartoon you have the, um, the reactants only going into the singlet state. Um, are the reactants always in that singlet orientation, the two uh, parts of the reactants? They are at the beginning. They can't go in the triplet. You, uh, unless one of these is already in a triplet state, then you can't go from there directly to this. And in your reactants, they all are already only in singlet states? Well, hang on, I think that's going to be the next slide. <laughs> so, the, the, yeah, the next slide is, we haven't had any, we need some chemistry. All we've shown now is that potentially the Earth's magnetic field can change the spin dynamics, change the probability of being in a singlet state. Okay, so if we now put in some chemical reactions which must conserve spin, the most obvious ones are that the singlet radical pair can just come back, transfer the electron back, back to where we started. These are singlet states, that's spin allowed. But let's suppose there is a product which would have to be in a triplet state, which can be formed from the triplet radical pair. So we can't go from there to here, and we can't go from the singlet pair to that product. Both of those would be spin forbidden. And so now we have a competition. The singlet radical pairs can come backwards, the triplet radical pairs can go forwards. And they're doing this both at the same time, these two reactions, at the same time as all of this is happening. So at any instant, the probability that you go forward or back <coughs> excuse me, is affected by the probability of being triplet or singlet. The higher the probability at any instant that you're in a triplet state, then the more likely you are to go this way. And that'll mean a high probability of triplet means a low probability of singlet, a low probability of coming back. So, at any instant, the presence and direction of the magnetic field can control whether you go back or forward. Okay, so all of this is happening at the same time, and so after a few microseconds, let's say, all of the radical pairs will have reacted, either forwards or back. And so the final yield of this product that you get will be an integral over the lifetime of the radical pair, and so will depend not only on the hyperfine interactions, but also on the way in which the spin dynamics were modified by the Earth's field, modified by its presence and its direction. So this is the thing that corresponds to that balancing stone block, a highly non-equilibrium state. It could go backwards, it could go forwards, tiny amounts of energy, many, many times smaller than kT, can affect the spin dynamics, affect the probability of going along these two competing pathways. And so at the end of the day, once all the radical pairs have disappeared, we have a yield of some product which depends on the direction of the field. And then all the bird needs to do is to detect that, to sense the direction of the field. So another Classical analogy may help here. I've got a slightly more complicated reaction scheme now, one that is slightly more relevant to the molecules that we think are involved in the magnetoreception, in which instead of there being just a reaction of the triplet under spin control to give the product, singlet and triplet can both react at the same rate to form the products which is actually a more likely 
reaction scheme because there are not so many product states which are triplets to give you a spin allowed reaction here. It's much more likely that one of the radicals reacts independently of the other and when that happens there are no spin selection rules and the reaction can happen with equal rate constants for singlet and triplet. But we've still got the same idea of a competition. A spin allowed reaction of the singlet backwards competing with now something that's not spin dependent going forwards. So you could think of that in terms of this sort of children's toy. You've got four buckets which you can put water in. These two represent singlet and triplet states of the radical pair. These two represent the reactants and the products. Um, you've got a tube connecting singlet and triplet with a tap here, which initially is partially open. So it allows some water to flow through from singlet to triplet. And at the same time, water is dripping out of this bucket into the reactant and from both buckets to the product these two reactions. So you start out by filling the singlet bucket and then just wait and see what happens. Some of the water will go here, some will go through to the triplet and go through to there, some will go directly from here to the product. And then you open the tap a bit so more water can get through into the triplet. And that will mean that more water ends up here and less there. And so by the time all the water is emptied out of these two top buckets, you have different amounts left in these two at the bottom, depending on how open or closed this tap was. So it's not a very good analogy because you know, a tap is not the same as this quantum mechanics. There's no oscillations going on here. But I think it gives some sense of why the final yield of the product can depend on the details of this step here, converting singlet and triplet. OK, and then what sort of magnetic field effect can you expect on the yield of this product? Well, schematically, it can look something like this. And we can calculate these things, and in different contexts, this sort of magnetic field dependence has been observed many times for different organic radical pair reactions. So it's a sketch of the yield of this product as a function of the strength of the applied magnetic field. And it's typically biphasic. So initially it goes up, increase in the yield, and then down, and then levels out. And the midpoint here typically is around one millitesla, which is a typical strength of a hyperfine interaction. 50 microtesla, the Earth's magnetic field, is down around this region. So this initial rise is known as the low field effect. As I say, you can calculate it, you can understand its origin, you can observe it experimentally for a variety of different radical pair reactions. And so the idea is that this rise, which can be very sharp for very weak fields, this could be the key to understanding the effect of the Earth's field. Yes? I'm confused by something um, kind of before that. So before in this um, time series, for yes. the um, fraction of single state, so you have, when you add the magnetic field, you get this beating frequency, right? Yes. So is that related to why you get this biphasic phase? I mean... Yes, it is. is it? Absolutely. So it's it's crucial. crucial. So this is basically you make the beating frequency longer, and then you get the... Um, like is that how you, I think because otherwise I'm confused because you actually in some cases you yeah. have lower singlet state which you want or you okay. have so, so I mean the, the, the mechanism of this effect at higher field I haven't talked about mm -hmm. um, but and, and it's because it's a much stronger field it's not really relevant in this context but you're absolutely right that beating is exactly what gives this low field effect so very briefly in terms of the quantum mechanics there are pairs of energy levels in the absence of a field which have the same energy. So their frequency, the energy gap between them is zero, the frequency is zero, so they don't oscillate. When you switch on the field, this splits them apart a little bit. 
maybe by 1.4 megahertz. And so now that starts to oscillate slowly. That's the slow beat at 1.4 megahertz. And that's an additional pathway to convert singlet into triplet. And that's precisely what gives this low field effect. OK, so let's summarize that where we've got to so far. So we've got some reaction scheme. Probably Henrik told you the other day that birds have an axial compass. It's not a polarity compass. So if the magnetic field were to be exactly inverted, to point in exactly the opposite direction, the birds would be none the wiser. This radical pair mechanism is consistent with an axial compass and not with a polarity compass. It could be consistent with the light dependence of the compass. The Vilchko showed that blue or green light is necessary for the birds to detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And that would be consistent with a photochemical process that required the higher energy of blue and green photons to produce the radicals. And also, this mechanism I've been talking about is well established. It's 40 years old now. There are hundreds of radical pair reactions that have been studied in the laboratory, which are known to be sensitive to magnetic fields of one millitesla or more. And that magnetic sensitivity is well understood. The theory is well developed. So the big question is not, is it a genuine mechanism, but is it the mechanism by which the birds sense the Earth's magnetic field? So Shulton suggested all of this in 1978. Um, most people who read the paper thought it was just an interesting curiosity, despite all of this stuff happening in the 20 years after his proposal. But everything changed 17 years ago when Ritz with Shulton proposed a particular molecule, cryptochrome, in which all of this radical pair chemistry could take place. And so I want to say a bit about cryptochrome. And then my final slide of the introduction is supposed to summarize where we've got to so far with the mechanism. We have the Earth's magnetic field experienced by the animal. Ritz and Shulton proposed that the receptors for the magnetic compass would be in the retina, which they thought was an obvious place if light was involved. This is a somewhat schematic representation of the retina with cells distributed around it, each of which would contain cryptochrome proteins, they proposed, which would need to be immobilized and aligned in order to be a direction sensor. You don't want these things randomly oriented or rotating. That might give you an intensity sensor, but wouldn't give you a direction sensor. So the molecules that are doing the sensing need to be aligned within the bird's body somehow or other, perhaps within the retina. And as, maybe as Henrik has already told you or will tell you later this morning, it is clear that the magnetoreceptors for the compass sense are in the retina. And so within the cryptochromes, Ritz and Shulton thought there would be the coherent spin dynamics I've been talking about, singlet, triplet, and conversion. And then somehow or other, there would be some signal transduction. And we'll talk a little bit about that if there's time. So, uh, yes. So, uh, so you showed this graph uh, of the travel view as a function of the magnetic field strength. But I was wondering if the travel view depends on the relative orientation of the magnetic field and the configuration of the hyperfine um, yeah, structure. Because we'll, we'll see an example of that later. It's a good question. Uh, I was wondering how, how can it be an How could it be an intensity sensor? Well, we, we don't think it is. Um, but I mean, if we go back to, th to this, this is depending on the strength of the applied field. Um, I mean, in principle, at least, the yield of this reaction product would depend on the strength of the field in this range. Does that help? But, but 
Oh, if they're not oriented, okay, then you would average out any directional information that they might deliver, but they would still be sensitive to the strength of the field. So, I mean, most of the experiments that have been done over the last 40 years have been for small radicals in liquids where they're rotating rapidly, no orientational order, and these all show effects of the magnetic field intensity. Okay, so before getting on to some experiments aimed at investigating this mechanism, Henrik wanted me to say something about magnetite. So, although for the compass sense, the radical pair mechanism looks the most likely mechanism, it's still not proven, there are other mechanisms out there, and the principal competitor would be particles of magnetic iron oxide, magnetite. So I've just got a couple of slides about this mechanism, which in principle could give you an axial compass sensor. Doesn't look very likely. Not much evidence at the moment for it, but at the moment we can't rule it out. So magnetite is Fe3O4, a magnetic form of iron oxide. Iron atoms have unpaired electrons and therefore magnetic moments. And a crystal of iron oxide has lots of iron atoms very close together. And so they all interact. And this can give you particles that have, for example, a permanent magnetic moment. And it's materials like magnetite, magnetic oxides that are used to make our magnetic compass needles. Now, the properties of magnetite depend on the size and shape of the crystals. So what we've got here is a picture that shows particles for different um, axial ratios and different lengths. So the actual ratio is the ratio of width to length. So if you think of these things as being um, little cubes, if this ratio is one, then we have a cubic crystal, or maybe spherical, and then as you stretch it to form a needle shape, then this axial ratio goes down from one towards smaller values. So these would be needle-shaped crystals, these more nearly cubic. And this would be the particle length, going on a logarithmic scale from 10 to 100 to 1,000 nanometers. Now, if the crystals are small, smaller than 30 or 40 nanometers, then they're what's known as superparamagnetic. So the ion atoms are all interacting with one another, but the crystals are not big enough to give that crystal a permanent magnetic moment. Rather, it has a magnetic moment which fluctuates wildly with time, pointing in different directions with different strengths from moment to moment. But then, when the crystals get a bit bigger, you can get a single domain. Then, the interactions taken over the whole crystal are large enough that essentially all of the spins line up, and then you have a permanent magnetic moment within this part of the phase diagram. But if you get the particles too big, then they can no longer be single domain, and they split up into multiple domains. And each of those domains has a permanent magnetic moment, but pointing in different directions. So multi-domain magnetite overall has much weaker magnetism than single domain because of this cancellation of the magnetic moments of different domains. Okay, and then you ask yourself, well, how big are the magnetic moments of these crystals? And that, again, depends on the length and the shape. And that's represented by these lines. So gamma is the ratio of the energy of interaction of the magnetic moment of the crystal, nu, with the magnetic field B relative to KT. So this is a, a essentially a classical mechanism. We're not with quantum mechanics anymore. And so the thermodynamics is 
extremely relevant. And if this number gamma is much less than one, then it's unlikely that this could be a basis for a compass sensor. If this is much bigger than one, then it looks more likely. And so if you have a big single domain crystal, its interaction with the Earth's field could be 10 times KT, meaning that that crystal would tend to align in the Earth's magnetic field, just like a <coughs> compass needle would. But if it's a bit smaller, then although it would be slightly more likely to be aligned along the field direction than opposite to it, uh, there wouldn't be very much alignment, very much ordering. So those are the different sorts of magnetite that can be formed. And all of this is really inspired by the discovery of magnetotactic bacteria. So there are organisms, these amongst them, that make magnetite crystals. So this is a false color electron micrograph of one of these bacteria, it's just a few microns long. And if you look at it under an electron microscope, you can see these black blobs, and each of these is a single domain crystal of magnetite. And you can see they're distinct from one another, they're each of them within a cell, and they're lined up in order that the individual magnetic moments add together. So this now would have a total magnetic moment much bigger. So it, its interaction with the Earth's magnetic field would be much bigger than KT, a much bigger magnetic moment than a single particle on its own. So this really is like a compass needle. This would have an interaction with the Earth's field of maybe 10 times KT. Each of these is about 40 nanometers across. And so this aligns the bacterium in the Earth's magnetic field. So it's not a sensing mechanism, it's purely passive. The animal has no choice about the matter, its body aligns itself along the lines of the Earth's magnetic field. So if bacteria can make magnetite in order to sense the magnetic field, and they need it to distinguish up from down, because they live in shallow pools of water and they don't want to be too near the surface because the oxygen content is too high and that's toxic for them and they're probably too light to use gravity to distinguish up from down. Okay, but clearly this is not how vertebrates sense or respond to the Earth's magnetic field. First of all, you'd need many more uh, of these magnetosomes to orient a bird, and clearly birds do sense the field rather than respond to it passively. So birds don't have this problem, which they would do if they had enough magnetite to align their bodies in the Earth's field. Okay, so what are the hypothetical mechanisms, the proposed mechanisms by which magnetite could give a magnetic sense? Well, here's one of them, stolen from an excellent recent review article. This supposes that we have a string, a chain of single domain particles of magnetite, which has a magnetic moment large enough that it tends to align in the Earth's magnetic field. And so it experiences a torque, a twisting force, like a compass needle, that would tend to align it along the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And then if it's attached to a magnetically sensitive ion channel, then as this chain twists in response to the direction of the magnetic field and its intensity, that might open the ion channel and give a signal transduction mechanism. This also assumes that all these uh, magnetosomes in different uh, neurons should be aligned for them to yes. clear the part. Absolutely, <coughs> they would need to be, if, if their magnetic moments were to reinforce, which they do in the bacteria. Yeah, but across different neurons, that's already a different question. So, I mean, it comes to, I think, a similar question here and for the cryptocrop. How likely is it that a structure within a, new, within a cell would be aligned across neurons? I mean, things tend to be much more random. And 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in the context of cryptochrome, I mean, the obvious structures that might align those proteins would be in the photoreceptor cells. For example, in the outer segments, where you have structures that are aligned with respect to the animal's body. And if you can then tether a cryptochrome, for example, somehow to a membrane protein in one of the membrane disks in an outer segment, then I think in principle, you've solved that problem of both immobilization and ordering. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, and cryptochromes are not membrane proteins. Nevertheless, the opsins are aligned within the membranes of the photoreceptors. So you could imagine that cryptochrome is tethered somehow, for example, to an opsin or another membrane protein. You don't need perfect alignment but you do need some. Not about this? How, how could that happen? Because this would be anywhere in the membrane. Why would I would talk be? about that in my talk. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll get back to that. Sorry. Uh, well, maybe you, you're going to talk about that, but then you also need, you don't only need to be all the radical pairs aligned, but to keep that alignment stable in time, because otherwise you have to recalibrate all the time. Yep. And if you don't do a, that, yep. your compass is not reliable anymore. Exactly. Correct. And we don't know in detail how that might be achieved. But we have at least we have ideas. likely possibilities. And I'll come back to those. Okay, good. So that would not give uh, an inclination compass. This would behave like a compass needle. If the field were inverted, then this would try to align in a different direction, you'd have a different effect on the ion channel. So if this has uh, any reality, it's more likely to be an intensity sensor for the birds. Other animals do have polarity compasses, and so this might be more relevant for other animals. That you've probably already seen, just to in <coughs> indicate what an inclination compass is. But you can get an inclination compass from magnetite in principle. Not much experimental evidence for it. But if you imagine superparamagnetic particles now, which don't have a permanent magnetic moment, tethered in some way by cytoskeletal filaments, perhaps to a membrane, then when the field is parallel to the membrane, the it would induce magnetic moments in these superparamagnetic particles, which would be aligned like this. So you can line up the spins within the magnetite in these small magnetite crystals. And they will, the magnetic moments on average will line up with the field direction. And so with a field oriented like this, these magnetic moments attract one another because we've got a North Pole here, and a south pole there. And so these attract one another and contract the membrane a bit. If, however, the field is perpendicular to the membrane, then the magnetic moments are in this direction. And now, just like bar magnets, if you bring them together side by side, bringing a north pole towards a north pole and a south to a south, then they repel. And so this would expand the membrane and perhaps open ion channels. And that would be independent of the polarity of the field. So exactly inverting the direction of the field, so it points up rather than down, would give you exactly the same expansion of the membrane. And so that's a hypothetical inclination compass based on magnetite. Not clear why that might be light dependent, and very little evidence for it, yes. The previous mechanism you showed with, the, with that one bar, if you have both this, this, these channels on two sides of one cell, would that also be like an inclination compass? It would be sensitive to polarity? Or is that not, not quite true? So if you had one of these outside? Just on two sides of the cell, like on opposite sides of the same cell. Or is that that's still a polarity compass? I don't quite see how that would give you an inclination compass. I need to think about that, but I think, it, I mean, it's still like, going to be like compass yeah, yeah. needles, I think. Okay, so 
Was that enough on magnetite? <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> okay, so, so now, now some experiments and also some calculations to investigate the uh, different aspects of this proposed mechanism. So when we started this about 10 years ago, we wanted a proof of principle. I've said that there are lots of radical pair... Oh, thank you, Eric, that's great. There are lots of radical pair reactions that have been studied, which are known to be magnetically sensitive, but typically people would start at a magnetic field of a few millitesla and then work up in field strength, often to several tesla. Of course, we want to go in the opposite direction. Start at a few millitesla and work down to 50 microtesla. So we wanted a molecule as a proof of principle that a radical pair reaction really could respond to a field as weak as that of the Earth. And the molecule that we hit on to do this test is this unlikely looking one. So it's a fullerene covalently attached to a porphyrin bonded to a carotenoid. And of course we chose this not because we thought anything remotely like this would exist inside a bird's body or anywhere else in biology, but because we thought it would have the right magnetic properties and the right photochemistry. And indeed it does. Carotenoids and porphyrins of course occur widely in nature, but probably not linked together in this way and certainly not with a fullerene tacked on the end. So what happens when you shine light on this molecule is that you get two sequential electron transfers. First from the porphyrin onto the fullerene and swiftly followed by an electron jumping from the carotenoid onto what is now a porphyrin radical. So within one nanosecond of the absorption of a photon we have a radical pair or more strictly a biradical because it's now intramolecular within a single molecule. So the net effect of the photo-induced electron transfer is to take an electron out of the carotenoid, put it in the fullerene. So the radicals are here. This is a positively charged. This one's negatively charged. This spacer in the middle that did the light absorption is back to being neutral. And we were able to show with this molecule, and because time is getting short, I won't go into detail, we were able to show that we can change the lifetime of this radical pair by magnetic fields weaker than 50 microtesla. So the first, and I think still the only demonstration of a radical pair reaction responding to an Earth strength magnetic field, and that the effect depends on the direction of a weak magnetic field and so, in principle, could be a chemical compass sensor. Yes? Um, how much weaker than 50 microtesla? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> About 40. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> okay, um, so, yeah, I'll skip those in the interest of time. So, that establishes the principle, more or less, of a directional sensor based on photochemistry. So what about this cryptochrome? So when Shulton proposed cryptochrome in 2000, uh, cryptochromes had only been known for a few years. They'd only been discovered in the early 1990s, uh, but it was already clear that when they absorb blue light, they form radicals by electron transfer. And he thought that this could be a likely molecule for magnetoreception. And I think that was a good guess or a good proposal. So cryptochromes are, were discovered in plants. They regulate, amongst other things, growth in plants. Um, and they are blue light sensors. They allow blue light to regulate growth of roots and um, uh, above ground the um, stems of the plants. And all cryptochromes contain a flavin adenine dinucleotide chromophore. In many other species, it's now known, flavins are involved in the regulation of circadian timing. In some species, as the photoreceptor, but in many others, in the regulation of the 24-hour rhythm. And they all contain this flavin chromophore, the one I talked about earlier, which absorbs blue light roughly 
the same wavelengths that the birds use uh, to, uh, for their compass. And next to the flavin, in red here, there are, in orange, three or sometimes four tryptophan amino acid side chains. And that's true of essentially all cryptochromes. So those groups within the protein are shown more clearly here. The FAD, the flavin, and the three tryptophans leading out from the center of the protein towards the surface of the molecule. And what happens when the flavin absorbs blue light is that triggers three sequential electron transfers <coughs> along this chain of tryptophans. So the flavin absorbs the light like that, and then one, two, three electron transfers along this chain. So this is like a molecular wire conducting electrons <coughs> from ultimately the terminal tryptophan to the flavin to give you a singlet radical pair. Here the homo of the terminal tryptophan, there the lumo of the flavin, separated by almost two nanometers. And it's that pair of radicals that Shulton thought might be magnetically sensitive. And so it proved. We've now done experiments on a variety of different cryptochromes. All of them show magnetic field effects. We can measure changes in the yields of stabilized radical states of the proteins that depend on the presence of a magnetic field. And as far as we can tell, these proteins do indeed seem to be fit for purpose as magnetoreceptors. So just a little bit about the photochemistry here. This would be the resting state of the protein with the flavin in its fully oxidized state. It would absorb blue light to form an excited singlet state. That's transferring the electron from the homo to the lumo. That would trigger these three electron transfers along the tryptophan <coughs> triad to form a radical pair consisting of the flavin and the terminal tryptophan radicals. That would then undergo the coherent singlet triplet into conversion I've been talking about. And then you have the chemical reactions. Either the singlet can undergo the back electron transfer that would take you back to the resting state, or you get a non-spin selective reaction of one or other or both radicals independently to form a longer lived state. And for the different cryptochromes we've looked at, they behave differently, but either the flavin radical picks up a proton to become a neutral radical, or the tryptophan radical loses a proton to become neutral, or both. So this happens at the same rate for singlet and triplet because they're reactions that involve only one of the radicals and not both. And then both of these processes occur on a time scale of about a microsecond. So long enough to allow this 1.4 megahertz oscillation to have a significant effect. And so we measure the magnetic field effects on the yields of these stabilized radicals which under the conditions of the experiments may have a lifetime of 100 microseconds or longer. So these are the products that I was talking about in the earlier slides. This, of course, is just for purified proteins in the laboratory. In vivo, we imagine that this would be too short-lived to be a signaling state. Probably what happens, and we see evidence of this, in the laboratory experiments is that the tryptophan radical here, which has been oxidized by the electron transfer, is returned to the ground state independently of the flavin. So then instead of having a pair of radicals inside the protein, you have just the flavin radical. And it's clear, at least from plant proteins, that once you get the flavin into this semiquinone state, then there is a change in the conformation of the, of the C-terminal domain of the protein. And it's that change in the shape of the protein which probably could initiate a signal transduction pathway. <laughs>
by affecting the ability of the cryptochrome to bind to other proteins, signaling partners. And that, in vivo, might have a lifetime of a second, allowing enough time for integration, averaging, signaling. So I won't go into the details of those experiments. Time is running short. So just a little bit on radio frequency fields, and then I'll wrap up. So how could you test this mechanism through behavioral experiments? Well, going back to this slide, we saw that there were a variety of frequencies with which singlet converts into triplet and back again. I've talked about the 1.4 megahertz that comes from the interaction of an isolated electron with the Earth's magnetic field, but there are also these higher frequency oscillations coming from the hyperfine interactions. So you could imagine the following experiment, that the bird experiences the Earth's magnetic field. It has this going on inside its retina. And then you apply a time-dependent magnetic field superimposed on the Earth's static magnetic field. And you choose that time-dependent field to have frequency that matches one of the oscillation frequencies in these traces here. So, for example, 1.4 megahertz, or maybe something at a higher frequency matching the hyperfine interactions. And so you, tr you aim for a resonance between the applied magnetic field and the natural frequencies of the radical pair. So I mean, this is analogous to pushing a child's swing. If you push it at the right frequency, it's natural oscillation frequency, then you can push the swing to a higher amplitude, or if you get the phase wrong, then you can stop it swimming, swinging altogether. So if we could interfere significantly with these oscillations with a radio frequency field of a few megahertz, say, that matched a frequency that matched one of the natural frequencies, then maybe we could screw this up and perhaps affect the bird's ability to recognize the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. So that's the idea. And you can use that then to learn something about what the radicals actually are that might be doing the magnetic sensing. So I've spoken exclusively so far about this Flavin tryptophan radical pair, the one that Shulton thought looked promising and the one that we find in the laboratory experiments does show magnetic field effects. But in vivo, it might be something different. The Flavin radical, in many ways, looks to be almost ideal for this purpose. But you lose a lot of those favorable properties if you pair it with something like tryptophan. Much better that the partner radical is much simpler than tryptophan, something, I've called it Z here, that perhaps has no significant hyperfine interactions, no magnetic nuclei, and so only has the two energy levels split by the Larmor frequency. So it's this one that would correspond to my calculated oscillations on the previous slide. And so can you design different radio frequency exposure conditions that would discriminate between these two sorts of radical pair. And there are reasons for thinking that this could be. This could be up to 100 times more sensitive than that one to the direction of an Earth strength magnetic field. Quite what this Z radical might be, we, we don't know, although we have ideas. So you can do some relatively simple calculations to estimate what effect different frequencies would have on the response of the radical pair. So if we think about the Flavin tryptophan, where both radicals have lots of energy levels, then every single energy gap could contribute to the singlet triplet in conversion, and so could be affected by a time-dependent field at the right frequency corresponding to these energies. So there are lots and lots of energy gaps. And so we have here a histogram of frequency of the applied field and the effect it would have on the yield of the reaction product. And you can see this is more or less flat 
out to about 100 megahertz. There is a cutoff because the highest frequency resonance you can get would be the one between the top energy level and the bottom one. And that is around 100 megahertz for a Flavin radical. So any radio frequency field beyond 100 megahertz shouldn't do anything. If it does, then that would be evidence against a radical pair mechanism. Okay, if you have this simpler radical pair, Flavin Z, then the energy levels look a bit different. They're the same for the tryptophan, sorry, for the Flavin radical. So you would still expect all of this stuff up to 100 megahertz. And there it is. You can just about see it relatively flat up to 100 and then nothing. But then you have a much stronger response from the Z radical because the only energy gap you have here is 1.4 megahertz because it has no hyperfine interactions. So every radical pair you look at can have a different energy gap giving you the singlet triplet interconversion for the flavin, but always has this unique one. So we get a whopping great spike here, 1.4 megahertz. We would get a very sensitive response at that frequency, the Larmor frequency, if it was this radical pair, and then much weaker responses spread out over 100 megahertz coming from the other radical. And if you integrate all these little peaks here, they come to the same integral as for the other radicals. You've got one radical of each. And then you can test slightly more realistic models. Maybe the two radicals interact with one another. Although they're, say, two nanometers apart, they may have a magnetic interaction. And that will give you something intermediate between these two. You won't get this sensitive response at the Larmor frequency. That'll be smeared out a bit. And so you can predict a different frequency response. And then you can use these, so different radical pairs could be distinguished by different radio frequency exposures. And then you can do a few calculations. One of the nice things about the radical pair mechanism is the theory is well developed. The quantum mechanics is well understood. And so for a variety of different exposure conditions, a single frequency at 1.4 megahertz, the Larmor frequency, or double that frequency, or broadband noise spread over a range of frequencies. You can do a variety of different radio frequency conditions and plot, calculate the yield of the reaction product as a function of the direction of the magnetic field. This, I think, was your question earlier on. So you can get some really quite striking dependence of the product yield on the direction of the field, which can be very different for different radical pairs. So I won't go into the interpretation of this, but you can give all of that to Henrik, who can then do the experiments and see which, if any, of these responses corresponds more, more closely to the response of the birds in their behavior, their orientational behavior, to the Earth's magnetic field in the presence of these different radio frequency conditions. I was going to talk something about the precision of the compass, but I think I've run out of time, so I will skip that. Um, and I can talk to people later if they're interested about this. Uh, if you want to read more about this, Henrik and I have written a review article last year, published in Annual Review of Biophysics. Um, the talk I've given, at least the introduction, more or less follows this review. Uh, so the first half of it is a tutorial on radical pairs and magnetic field effects in the context of magnetoreception, and then the second half is a review of what is known about um, radical pair magnetoreception, principally in birds. So if you've wondered what birds think about when they migrate, then maybe it's that, or possibly they're thinking something related. Um, I'm sure none of you is in that condition and thank you for listening. <laughs>